drawing board and craft something narrower. Um, what about hospitals and healthcare workers? Because that was a, a different rule that the court was also examining at the same time, right? That's right. And so the court actually allowed this rule to go into effect. So this was a rule that was different from the OSHA rule. This was a rule that actually was a vaccine mandate, so not a testing or vaccine mandate, for workers in healthcare facilities that treat Medicare or Medicaid patients. So basically they get federal funds and treat vulnerable populations. Individuals who work in those facilities are required under this new policy to be vaccinated, and the court upheld that policy. And the court also said, look, it's actually really common as a matter of state law for healthcare workers to have to be vaccinated. And so this isn't breaking new ground in the way the court seemed to think this sweeping OSHA mandate was. Yeah, that hospital ruling, that was 5-4. You had Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Brett Kavanaugh joining the liberals here. That is kind of a win for the Biden administration, but a big loss when you talk about this OSHA rule that President Biden said would be the difference maker in making sure workers across the country were safe, at least at big companies. Kay Shaw, thanks a lot. Thank you, Brett. Next up on Start Here, the DOJ said more arrests were on the way. Well, they kept that oath. January 6th prosecutions kick up a notch after the break. Stories of our time and time. Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17 year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do they catch her for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen she's in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is too high for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? And figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know when the truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bombshell. We're on urgent delivery. Run. Not afraid to go there. So my question is, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now, right as the Supreme Court was smacking down the Biden administration on judicial grounds, the president was getting roughed up politically by a fellow Democrat. While I continue to support these bills, I will not support separate actions that worsen the underlying disease of division infecting our country. This was Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema telling the world there's no way I'm going along with the president's plan to revamp the filibuster. Keep in mind, this is as President Biden is on the way to the Capitol to try to whip up support in the face of Republican opposition to a new voting rights bill. I hope we can get this done. The honest to God answer is, I don't know whether we can get this done. Well, here she is basically slamming the door in his face. But as last January 6th showed, even even clear election results aren't necessarily immune from being subverted. And as this Capitol Hill drama was unfolding yesterday, the Department of Justice was issuing a momentous arrest. 11 members of the Oath Keepers militia group charged with seditious conspiracy, including the group's leader, Stuart Rhodes, arrested in Texas. You might remember we talked last week about the Oath Keepers with ABC's investigative producer Mike Levine. He talked about the number of militia members who were involved with the insurrection. Well, the leader of the Oath Keepers has now been arrested, and Mike Levine is back with us this morning. Mike, there have been lots of arrests over people storming the Capitol in the last year. You've been saying this arrest is fundamentally different. Why? Yeah, this arrest is different. Stuart Rhodes never stepped foot inside of the Capitol. The charges that we've seen over the past year or so, right, they've involved charges like assault on law enforcement, obstructing an official proceeding, you know, illegally entering the Capitol or some sort of conspiracy related to those types of charges. But with this arrest, the charge is, is seditious conspiracy. The government is alleging that this was sedition, that, that, that the people charged here were actually trying to usurp the government through force. You've got deep state control judges. I would consider Roberts one of them. You've got deep state control puppets all through the media. So Stuart Rhodes is the founder of the Oath Keepers. He started back in 2009, right after President Barack Obama took office. Oath Keepers Association of current serving and former military military, uh, police and firefighters, all of us who swore oath to support and defend the Constitution against all of these foreign domestic. You know, he has an eye patch. He's a he's actually a Yale Law graduate who 
now bases much of his rhetoric on what others say is a total misinterpretation of the law. Here, look, the, the secrets that the deep state holds on people, the, the, all the pedophile stings, all the sex prostitution stings, all of this, is how they control everybody. And this, here's a quote that I, want to, uh, that I want to lay out from the indictment. It says that, quote, some members of the Oath Keepers believe that the federal government has been co-opted by a secret group of elites actively trying to strip Americans of their rights. So that's the type of rhetoric that, that Stuart Rhodes has been associated with since he founded this group back in 2009. The leader of the Oath Keepers has been arrested in Little Elm. This afternoon, we saw federal agents collecting evidence at a home there. When he was arrested yesterday, Rose was supposed to have a virtual interview with the January 6th investigators in the House, and Rose and his lawyer were on the phone prepping for that interview when the FBI called Rose on his phone and told him to come outside with his hands up so he could be arrested. Rose then added his lawyer into the call, and the three of them, the FBI, Rose, and his lawyer, discussed how Rose could come out and be taken into custody, and that's how the arrest happened. Well, and you were telling us last week, Rose did not go in the Capitol. That's been his defenses. You know, I didn't go in, and I disagree with anyone who did go in. So, I mean, what is he alleged to have done that would add up to sedition? So the government in the indictment that's been released, they, they say that this really started in November, certainly in December, right, after the election, after after Joe Biden had been projected the winner. It's all going to come to fruition on January 20th. And between now and then, my hope and expectation is that the American people are, do know and do understand that there has been a transition. Call Stuart, can you not feel history happening right now? I mean, it's happening right now. It is, and we're all, we all need to realize that we're Americans. We're born in this country at this time for this purpose. There is a lot of detail about how various Oath Keepers members were communicating leading up to January 6th and talking about how they had to go there. According to the indictment, two days after the election, Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes allegedly messaged followers, we aren't getting through this without a civil war. And how they had to bring weapons and how they needed to be prepared to do what needs to be done to stop Joe Biden from being certified as the president. And days later writing, we must now do what the people of Serbia did when Milosevic stole their election. Refuse to accept it and march in mass on the nation's capital. In text messages and communications, encrypted communications with members of the Oath Keepers who've been charged along with him in this alleged conspiracy, Stuart Rhodes talks about how they're going to set up what he calls quick reaction forces outside of D.C. These are Oath Keeper members that came from Arizona, Florida. Rhodes has denied urging the group to storm the Capitol, but prosecutors said he and others made plans to bring weapons to the area to support the operation. The indictment details how Stuart Rhodes allegedly spent more than $15,000 on firearms just for himself and related equipment. I know how you feel, but go home and go home in peace. On the afternoon of January 6th, court documents say Rhodes told the group, all I see Trump doing is complaining. He went on to say, so the patriots are taking it into their own hands. So if this represents a turning point in the prosecutions of January 6th, if this is a turning point in how the DOJ is thinking about this now, not just as trespassing on government property or even violence, but sedition, What's next for this investigation? Well, I think, you know, we sort of touched on this, but I think this shows that federal authorities are, are looking at people when it comes to January 6th who, again, never stepped foot in the Capitol and, and how they may have contributed to what happened on that day. You know, it's hard to know for certain where we go from here, but certainly authorities will be looking at anyone that they think was in touch with these people, you know, Stuart Rhodes, and, and how that may have contributed to what happened on January 6th. Yeah, I guess the question will be, could you see charges brought against other militia members, other organizers? Could you even see members of the Trump administration or anyone, whether they were wearing a suit or not, who is seen to have been inciting this, what the DOJ clearly sees as an attempted overthrow of democracy? Mike Levine, thank you. Thank you. Earlier this week, we talked about allegations that top universities have colluded to reduce the amount of financial aid they give out. You could feel the rage on Twitter of students and former students who feel like they've been taken advantage of every step of the way. We were told that college was necessary for success, but then we graduated from college, came out with more education than our parents, made less than our parents, and had twice the debt burden as our parents. Well, if that wasn't enough, yesterday, the student loan company Navient announced it was canceling nearly $2 billion worth of student loans for tens of thousands of students. This was not because it was an act of charity. This was the result of a huge settlement with more than a dozen states who say these students were victims of a scheme. Student borrowers already facing financial hardships we're simply driven further into debt. Josh Mitchell is the author of one of the year's most acclaimed books, The Debt Trap. And Josh, you studied the entire student loan industry. First, can you just explain what happened here? Right. So Navient was an arm of Sally May. And these have to do with loans that Sally May extended to students in the early 2000s to attend for-profit colleges. Fortunately, my lender paired me with Navient. Their team helped me find a plan to stay on my path. Basically, Sally May had arrangements with for-profit colleges that if these colleges steered students to take out Sally May loans, then Sally May would allow these students to borrow more to pay tuition at these schools. So it helped both the schools and Sally May. I think what we're grappling with really is the predatory nature of debt. Now, the allegations here are that Sally May knew that a lot of these schools had sketchy track records um, that were not going to graduate these students to help them get good jobs, and that a lot of these students had bad credit. And so basically, they were destined to default on these loans. That's one of the allegations here, that basically Sally May was being a predatory lender, putting people in loans that they knew they were going to default on. Knowing they default because, A, they didn't have great track records with money, and B, these degrees are not, <laughs> like, they didn't think the degree might be worth enough to actually help them pay that back later. Right. There's also another allegation here, which is that when students were repaying their loans, a lot of these students got into trouble in terms of being able to repay them. They were defaulting on them. And so they would go to Navient and say, what can I do so that I can stay on top of my loans? And the allegation here is that Navient said, oh, just go into forbearance, which is basically a way of saying you can put your loans on pause. Forbearance sounds great because zero payment. Everybody loves that. But the problem with forbearance is that it's just increasing the balance. Now, students have the option to, to do this, but it's not always the best option because you put your loans on pause and the interest accrues. And so that's what that's what Nav Navient is being accused of doing here. Navient chose not to disclose 
close or talk through with those borrowers when those borrowers called for help. Just really quickly saying, hey, go go into forbearance, no problem at all. And the student thinks, okay, great. And then they see months, months after the fact that their balance has risen by thousands in some cases because of interest. 63% of borrowers who made payments with Navient uh, during the COVID forbearance still owe more now than they originally borrowed. They're accused of two things, deceptive, lend deceptive lending on the front end and then not doing enough to help students get into the best repayment plan on the back end. And so as part of the settlement, Navient doesn't actually have to admit they did anything wrong, right? They they're all still saying this was based on unfounded allegations. They did have to fork over a ton of money or I guess forgive a ton of debt. So who does not have to pay their bills now? Like who are these students that get forgiveness? These loans are going to be canceled. Mm -hmm. So basically Nav Navient has to eat the losses here. Uh -huh. Now it's important to know that these are mostly private loans, meaning this was not part of the federal student loan program. And so therefore it's investors, the company itself, uh, Nav Navient, which took ownership of the loan, they are going to suffer the losses here. Well, and so you mentioned how like all the intertwinedness can get so confusing. Sally Mae becomes all these companies, Navient ends up doing the settlement after doing its thing for years. What does this mean, not just for Navient, but for like colleges at large who are all dealing with students on student loans? So this is the tip of the iceberg when we're talking about the problems facing people with student loans. What's ironic here is this. I was looking at the press release from the New York Attorney General uh, last night um, to, to look at what Sally May was accused of. And there was, this, there was this line that said, Sally May knowingly made loans to students that they knew were going to default on the loans because of the schools they attended and because of the credit, they, because they had bad credit. The federal government does that every single day. Americans owe more than $1.7 trillion in student loans. That's more than credit cards and auto debt. This isn't like a conversation of like, well, it doesn't really work very well. Like, it clearly doesn't work. It gives loans out to people that have very bad credit, going to school, that often don't have a good record of graduating students and getting them good jobs. So you're saying there's a problem with like the concept of student loans sometimes more than just a company. Right, that's what I'm saying is that, you know, so what Sally May is accused of doing is something that the broader education department federal loan program does every day. And I think we are starting to see as a society in Congress what the repercussions of that loose lending is. Roughly one in five borrowers are in default and the challenges are even worse for students of color. This is unsustainable. A lot of people were defaulting on their loans before the pandemic and the student loan pause came into place and they're trying to figure out what do we do. Right, but then that makes me wonder if you're pointing out how this is endemic to so many students across the country, how they all feel this crushing debt that they can't afford to pay off, whether that was noticed by lenders or not, are we going to see some sort of much wider forgiveness program from the government? Yeah, so as of now, I don't think anything is going to happen. I just based on reading the tea leaves and seeing what's happened so far. That being said, what I find interesting is that basically uh, since the pandemic and all the way through this spring, students who have student loans have been allowed to not make payments each month. That will have been more than two years that people will have not made payments. And it does raise the question, what happens if there's another downturn? What happens if there's another crisis after the pandemic? Is Congress just going to implement another pause? Um, so I think that there are this, there's this really big, broad existential question facing the student loan program right now, which is, is the government going to continue to just give everyone a blank check? And then what happens on the back end when people go years without making a payment? And when you look at a country that now has a million less college students than it did at the beginning of the pandemic. We've seen how this has kind of shriveled up the number of students in the college system. Uh, Josh Mitchell, author of the book, The Debt Trap. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And one last thing. And what about fracking? All right, now, let me, let me, have, let me allow Vice President Biden to respond. I never said I oppose fracking. Could this be the end of presidential debates? Show the tape. Put it on your website. I'll put it on. Put it on the website. Yesterday, kind of buried in the news about the Supreme Court on January 6th, we learned that the Republican National Committee is planning a rule change in which it won't allow the Republican nominee to participate in the big traditional final debates. Tonight's debate is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. It is conducted under health and safety protocols designed by the Commission's health security advisor. Unlike the primaries, these debates are run by the nonpartisan Commission on Presidential Debates, and the RNC was furious with that commission in 2020 over some rule changes because of COVID, in a year where many votes were already being cast before the final debate had aired. A debate initially scheduled for tonight was canceled after the President's COVID-19 diagnosis. President Trump rejecting the debate commission's decision to make it a virtual debate. Since then, the RNC has asked for assurances about who gets to make decisions and when. There are Republicans on that commission, and that decision was made in part due to health concerns because of lack of disclosure. Well, they're not nonpartisan Republicans. Those Republicans have been very critical of this president. They basically challenged the idea that anyone who's been critical of President Trump in the past should be allowed a role in proceedings, which usually would not matter that much. The commission deals with campaigns, not parties. So if both candidates agree, sorry, parties, they're going to do the debates. But one of the side effects of the Trump years is that this RNC is now run by Trump loyalists, meaning if they say they're done with these debates, that means if Trump runs again, he's probably done with them too. So what would a world without these final debates look like? I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. For years, televised debates have offered some iconic moments. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. In an increasingly polarized country, there's a case to be made they matter less than ever. Like, who's actually making up their mind in October based on some zinger they just heard? From, from everything I see, has no respect for this person. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet, States. No puppet, no puppet. And it's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's pretty we have seen meaningful polling shifts as a direct result of these debates. Often just a point or two, but Al Gore would remind you that can be all you need. The commission says it's still planning on fair, neutrally run debates in 2024. But if we just saw the final presidential debate of the modern era, it's been quite a ride. 
So the Democrats might be done with the Iowa caucuses. Republicans might be done with just debating their ideas live on television. Buckle up for 2024. Start Here is produced by Kelly Therese, Brenda Salinas Baker, Lewis Millman, Madeline Wood, David Toledo, Jen Newman, Vika Aronson, and Tara Gimble. Ariel Chester is our social media producer. Josh Cohan is our podcast manager. I'm our managing editor. Liz Alessi is our executive producer. Thanks to Lakia Brown, John Newman, Elizabeth Russo, and Stacia Dashishku. Special thanks this week to Chris Berry, Kevin Ryder, Sarah Kolonoski, Micah Cohen, Kurt Biarosa, and Avery Harper. I'm Brian Milkey. See you next week. America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Good job. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We got this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pam. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. News honored winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the award for overall excellence in television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Moore, America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. And good morning, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Happy Friday, and thanks so much for streaming with us this morning. We are taking you inside Children's Hospital in Ohio, admitting more COVID patients than ever before and with less staff as we follow the Supreme Court decision on President Biden's vaccine or test mandate for large businesses as he promises $1 billion at home, rapid tests, and high-quality masks for everyone. At a major arrest in the January 6th insurrection investigation, the leader of the far-right Oath Keepers militia group, along with 10 others, charged with seditious conspiracy and set to face a judge today. And the massive student loan settlement expected to erase loans for tens of thousands of students. But we begin overseas, where North Korea fired two ballistic missiles overnight, the third launch this one, this month, rather. This one happening just hours after Pyongyang accused the United States of, quote, escalating the situation with sanctions. Chief Global Affairs' Martha Raditz has the latest on that for us. Good morning, Martha. There is no quicker way to get the world's attention than a missile launch, and North Korea fired not one but two short-range ballistic missiles. The type of missile appears similar to prior tests. This test launch happening roughly 12 hours after North Korea publicly warned of a stronger and certain response after the U.S. announced sanctions against North Korea, those sanctions targeting six North Koreans involved in its nuclear and ballistic missile programs. Since President Biden took office, there have been at least 14 missile tests. While none of those tests involved long-range or intercontinental ballistic missiles, it is a clear provocation and also shows that the North is working to improve its weapons delivery system. Kira? All right, Martha Raddox, thanks so much. Now to the new development overnight for Novak Djokovic. The Australian visa for the tennis star revoked for the second time now. The number one seed is facing possible deportation yet again, just days before the Australian Open is set to begin. Will Reeve has been following the story for us and has more. Hi, hi Will. Novak Djokovic will be detained at 8 a.m. Saturday in Melbourne after an interview with immigration officials as his lawyers appeal the decision to cancel his visa for a second time. The Australian Minister for Immigration announced overnight he was using his power to once again cancel Djokovic's visa on, quote, health and good order grounds on the basis that it was in the public interest to do so. Djokovic's lawyer arguing that the grounds for the second cancellation differ from the first last week and what a week plus it has been. Djokovic came to play the Australian Open on what he called an exemption permission only to be detained at the airport where his visa was canceled. He appealed that and won on narrow technical grounds and he was let go from the quarantine facility where he was being held but there were indications that his visa may be revoked again and that is what happened. Djokovic will be allowed to meet with his lawyers on Saturday before we're going back into detention on Saturday night. Then on Sunday, there will be an appeal hearing. If Djokovic loses that hearing, he will be banned from Australia for three years. Kira? 
All right, we'll continue to follow the drama, Will. Thank you. Turning now to the fight against Omicron, we're seeing encouraging signs in the Northeast, while some hospitals in certain parts of the country are dealing with high numbers of COVID patients. Kana Whitworth takes us inside a hard-hit children's hospital now in Ohio. This morning, hospitals pushed to the brink amid the wild surge of Omicron. Children's hospitals.